a living hope. We come together in an intense moment. My heart goes out to all of you, as in one way or another, you face the pandemic of the COVID-19. Our prayers are with the families that are fighting for the health and lives of their families, for the individuals that are facing this battle alone, for all those who are facing emotional, relational, financial, and spiritual impact of this pandemic. At the same time, we pray in gratitude for all the heroes in the health industry and others that are helping us, putting us through this challenging time, but helping us all through it. You're a demonstration of God's living hope. You know, a nurse moved from Oklahoma to New York City in the middle of this pandemic because she wants to help and be a living hope in this time of need. I was talking to my daughter who works in a company that recruits nurses, and she shared with me of a Rhode Island respiratory therapy nurse who had retired and decided because of this pandemic to return to work. She's gonna to travel to Boston daily to work in one of our hospitals in need. She was retired, but she decided to come back. You know, she has grown kids who were discouraging her from doing this. She has multiple dogs that she actually has to put in the kennel for them to be taken care of so that she can go work and serve the people of Boston. You know, to her kids, she said, I have a gift. I have a skill that is needed. It's my duty to serve and save lives. She is a living hope for many in this vital time of need. And I know that many of you, in one way or another, are vehicles of living hope for your families, neighbors, coworkers, and our community. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being God's hands and feet. You know, in Genesis chapter one, God tells us when he created the world, in the day number three, he looked at what he had created and said, it was good. In the fourth day, he looked at what he had created and he said, it was good. He continued working and day number five, he looked and he said it was good. On day number six, after he created man and women and after he gave them direction on how to take care of his good world, he looked at all he had done and he said, it's very, very good. You know, God's plan for man was, is, and will always be very good. As God looks at us today, he knows that there's a potential for good, that there's potential for very good inside of all of us. With him, there's always hope. You know, today we celebrate the greatest news of hope that mankind has ever heard, the resurrection of Christ. Sadly, the passing of time can become old news. That's been the case with many historical news over our lifetimes. You know, in the 1800s, a vaccine was created for smallpox, another one for rabies, for tuberculosis, and for cholera. Those diseases had killed millions. And I'm sure at the time when they were heard about, it was great news, you know, but it can become just old news. In 1846, anesthesia was created. Can you imagine an operation without anesthesia? I'm grateful even just to go to the dentist because of anesthesia, forget all the other kinds of operations. Oh, praise God that that good news has come about. But the truth is we can get accustomed to that as well. You know, there's one day gonna be the news of the coronavirus vaccine. And I'm sure that day we'll all think, that's good, that's very good. But sadly, over time, it will also be taken for granted and it'll become just old news. Today, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, let's not miss the significance, the power, the truth, the potential, the importance of this great news. The fact of the resurrection is news like never before. You know, personally, the account of the resurrection changed my story and define my life 37 years ago, and it still does so today. It's the reason I get up with passion about living in my day and trying to help as many people as possible. It's the conviction I have about, you know what? I might fear sickness, but I don't fear death. Because if the resurrection is true and I'm living for it, oh, that's great news. It's not just good news. Today, therefore, I wanna to talk to you about two principles, two truths today reflected in the Bible and central to the Christian faith. Number one, an empty tomb. And number two, open doors. You know, the Apostle Paul was known as the Apostle of Faith. The Apostle John as the Apostle of Love. The Apostle Peter is the Apostle of Hope. Why? I think because at one point in his life, he had lost hope. But this man that had lost hope in the resurrection of Christ found hope and found the purpose to his life. 
We've got to learn from a man like that in a time like today when we need to live by hope. The resurrection of Christ provides hope for everybody and for anybody. Read with me in 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. It says there, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The author, Peter, a man who had found hope in this empty tomb, a man who had found an open door there as well. You know, the crux to the Christian faith is an empty tomb. It's truth that gives life. It's truth that gives hope. Peter had been a follower of Jesus. He walked with him. He learned from him. He had changed his life. He had changed his priorities. He had changed his destiny because of him. But really, the greatest event for Peter's life was that he saw, he witnessed, he experienced the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what transformed him. From an emotional, impulsive, inconsistent follower, he became a courageous, bold, faithful, trustworthy, humble, and wise man of God. You know, but it's not only about Peter. If you look through history and you study about first century Christians or really any real, real Christian, that resurrection transforms our lives. There's a book called The Empty Tomb, and it's a fictitious letter from Caiaphas, the high priest, to Ananias, his father-in-law, during the time of Jesus, describing his reaction to the resurrection of Jesus. It's a fictitious account, but it captures something of the surprise that the high priest must have felt as he observed the behavior of those early Christians. And I'll read from that. How could they one day plan and carry through a gigantic hoax and the next day be themselves taken in by it? It utterly defeats my understanding. But that's what happened. It changed them almost out of recognition. You could practically see them becoming new men before your eyes. Instead of frightened, dispirited, weak creatures, they were on, that were, they were on the day of their leaders of cruc crucifixion, they were at once transformed men of boldness, confidence, and strength. Instead of being in terror of us as they had been, they didn't even seem to care of any of the threats we made or even any of the action we took. They openly paraded their false doctrine to the very streets in the city and deliberately flouted out every effort to silence them. And still the perplexities continue to pile up. You know, but not only in a fictitious story like this, but you can read through history, either Fox Book of Martyrs or any other book regarding the history of first century Christians. And you see transformed individuals that have now become people of great confidence, boldness, and were willing not only to live, but willing to die because of the conviction of this living hope. And so today, you and I, we got to consider, what does this empty tomb say to you and I? How does the truth of the empty tomb affect you today? Do you live with this living hope? You know, if you call yourself a Christian, does the empty tomb truly define you? with a confidence that you know there's life beyond this and therefore you live this life with a conviction and a passion to help as many as possible to get to that other life. And if today you're not a Christian, I encourage you to find out if this tomb really was empty or not. Because I believe if you decide this is true, it'll affect your priorities, it'll affect your perspective, it'll affect your personality. Which leads to my second point, open doors, open doors. You know, that empty tomb leads to open doors. The same author, Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, says to us, baptism now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is now at God's right hand with angels, authorities, powers, and submission to him. Talk about an open door. You know, one of the highlights of this past month for me was in the middle of this pandemic, was witnessing the baptism of Ruben Salazar, a man in his 70s, who now decided to value this empty tomb 
and the open door of forgiveness that God is offering him. You know, most 70 year olds, honestly, right now are staying in their homes and protecting themselves. And that's right. They should be doing that. But I appreciate that during this time, Ruben decided, this is my moment. It's not my moment to ignore the tomb. It's my moment to respond to the tomb. He wanted to have a clean conscience for his past decades of sin. In his eyes, there's no time like the present. And so he decided it's time to get right with God. And this past week, he repented, he was baptized, and you should see him walking around right now. He's walking around sharing about his living hope, about his living God. And how about you? You know, some people that I'm studying the Bible with say, when this pandemic subsides, then I'll take this seriously. I'd like to say to you, now is the right moment to get right with God. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another week. Don't wait another month. God is referring to an open door. Also in 2 Peter, the same author, a little chapter later on, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to verse 11, he tells us of how God's divine power provides you and I an open door to heaven today. Let's read there. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. He says, For this may, very reason, make every, every, every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never fall, you'll never stumble, and you'll receive a rich welcome, open doors, into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Those are the open doors I'm talking about. My prayer for you and me and for all those that are listening today, is to walk one day through those open doors and receive a rich welcome by our Heavenly Father. You know, two of my heroes in the faith, Bob Gimple and Wyndham Shaw, passed away this past year. But you know, when I heard about that news, in both situations, I considered their lives and meditated on this scripture. I knew them both well. I knew how they lived, I knew what they taught. They lived this out, and they taught it out. So I am confident to say that those doors were, are, and will be open for people like them today and every day. And so my prayer is for you. I pray that the present circumstances will lead us to take more seriously than ever the truth that life is brief and that our good God has set up a very good plan for you to be with him here and in eternity. The door is open. The tomb is empty. Will you celebrate with him? Will you obey his direction? You know, as we celebrate the communion, we're remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus. The body and blood shed for you and me. We're celebrating his very good plan. A very good plan for those who had lost hope to find a living hope and to be able to walk through those open doors one day. And so if you're gonna partake in the Lord's Supper, you're saying yes to the fact, I believe in the open door. Yes to the fact, I believe in that empty tomb. I believe that there is an open door available to reach our Father in heaven. And yes, that I wanna be a part of God's loving, compassionate plan to let the world know that our good God wants to provide them with hope. Let us daily look to be living hope for those around us. You never know what opportunities you will have. Join me in prayer. God Almighty, we thank you so much that you have set a plan in motion so that we could respond to the empty tomb, that we could appreciate the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord. We thank you that 
We can respond by repenting, by being baptized, by walking faithfully towards you. We thank you that you provide us a living hope in Jesus. We thank you that there's so many demonstrations of that living hope in people around us. Help each one of us as we take the fruit of the vine, as we take the bread in memory of your body, to value the lives you've given us and to live lives that respond to this living hope. Bless the world today. Help us all seek you like never before. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless.